This is Talkback, 721-1290 or 1-800-568-5309. This is News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM, KGVO. Missoula's News and Weather Station. Hey, welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Here it is, uh, the Tuesday, October 29th edition of Talk Back. Talk Back this morning is brought to you by our friends over at Harrington Surgical Supply, where you can feel confident in Harrington Surgical Supplies' discreet and knowledgeable guidance on a multitude of products and medical supplies. We're also brought to you this morning by 123 Seamless Gutters, where they're family owned and operated. Offering gutter installations, repairs. Don't forget those gutter guards. Get those installed by calling 406-240-2669. They're protecting the foundation of your future. Also brought to you by Y West Storage out of the Y on Two Smokes Way. If you need storage, the number to call is 406-510-0590. There you go. Y West Storage making room for you. And by Phillips Janitorial. Uh, if you have your or your home and or your business, if they, they need cleaning, nobody does it better. No job is too big or small. Call 406-260-6617 for Phillips Janitorial. The views and opinions expressed on TalkBack are not those of the staff, management, or advertisers. Well, good morning, everybody. It is good to be here with you. I am Peter Christian. That is Mr. Nick Christians. And over there, good morning, Mr. Nick. Good morning. And we are expecting a whole room full of friends here uh, any minute. Uh, from the University of Montana Mansfield Center. And uh, so we're hoping that they will be able to get here on time and safely. Uh, so anyway, but aside from that, uh, until they arrive, we can just uh, chat amongst ourselves and have open phones. What do you think? Yeah, well, let's uh, let's plan to just have open phones. And if they come, great. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's yeah, uh, let's yeah. encourage our callers to call and and uh, let us know what's going on in their world. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, what's happening out there? Uh, I, I did notice that we, we we're getting some more and more rain. I'm not sure exactly. Do you know exactly when the snow is supposed to arrive? Uh, actually, Wolfie sent a message to me earlier from next door. He said okay. that uh, the Bitterroot, I think, was already getting hit. He said, yeah, some snow in the Bitterroot Valley, not a lot, but... There've already been some drivers off the road oh, this morning, boy. so that yeah. was at about six. Yeah. So, yeah. good to know. And so, I'm sure that if you haven't already put your snow tires on, my who needs is, snow tires? My my hand bunch is of, up. Bunch of babies. You don't need <laughs> snow tires. Just drive around it. It's fine. I I moved here, never <laughs> driving in the snow with a little tiny uh, ninety nine Honda Accord, not knowing what I was doing, and I never had any problems. Granted, that was probably not the best decision, but at least <laughs> I was okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it is it is open phones, at least until our guests arrive. I know we do have a, a guest coming in at 9 o'clock this morning that is going to be accompanied by Dr. Mirdad Kia. Uh, Professor Amir Al-Azan, a Syrian scholar, is going to be joining us in the 9 o'clock hour. But uh, in the 8 o'clock hour, we had scheduled our friends from the... Uh, from the uh, University of Montana Mansfield Center. So uh, I do believe we have folks already calling in for open phones, and that's great. So let's uh, talk about whatever is on your mind this morning. I believe uh, Roy is up first. Roy, good morning, sir. You're on TalkBack. What's up? Yeah, good morning. I got something very sad to say. Oh, go ahead. Uh, It really saddened me that I'm a member of the NRA, and I was sad to see that John Testa got an F from the NRA. Okay. An F, an F from the NRA, according to the NRA, says, a true enemy of gun owners' rights, a consistent anti-gun candidate who always opposes gun owners' rights and or actively leads anti-gun legislative efforts our sponsors anti-gun legislation. Uh, I was really surprised, but uh, I also think that John Tester has been in there too long. I don't believe in uh, politicians should make a career out of out of uh, being in one office. I think if Abraham Lincoln survived, he would have only run the two terms and would have got out. But uh, anyways, that's, uh, I was surprised. And uh, well, I, uh, well, 
Well, let, let, let's put it this way, Roy. It's... Roy, we, we have invited Senator Tester on this program numerous times, innumerable times, in fact, uh, to right. answer questions from our listeners. And he has uh, just either been too busy or simply has not wanted to come. So um, we, have, we all have questions for him. Uh, but uh, if he will not show up and talk with people, then we can't know. Well, maybe it's time for John to go back to the farm. I'm sure when he first started, he, he he's probably, I imagine he's voted for some good legislation, but maybe it's time to go back to the farm, let somebody younger get in there. Well, we we will see in uh, one week from today, in fact. One week from today is election day, so we're going to find out in seven days. Okay, that's all I have, Peter. Hope you all have a have a nice day. You've got about an uh, inch of snow at my place, where, and uh, I'm where, probably going to stay. Where, whereabouts do you live? Go ahead. I live in uh, in the foothills okay. above Corvallis. Oh, cool. Okay, all right. Well, listen, be safe, and thank you so much for the call, Roy. We appreciate it. We're up against a break. We have Nancy and Ed to both waiting to visit with us. We're going to come right back. Uh, we're just going to assume we're going to have open phones uh, until 9 o'clock this morning. And if, if something else happens, we will pivot. But uh, the phones are open. Whatever you want to talk about. It's 721-1290-1800-568-5309. We're coming right back after this. Dennis Bragg with your town square weather. A chance of rain or higher elevation snow showers early today. Otherwise, partly sunny and cool again with highs in the mid-40s. Clearing skies bring the formation of some valley fog Wednesday morning with temperatures into the teens and low 20s, but then warming into the upper 40s under sunny skies. Our next major weather system starts to have impacts later Thursday with a chance of rain or higher elevation snow showers and then a possible rain-snow mix down into the valleys Thursday night into Friday morning. Hey, Kay, welcome back to Talk Back. And we, we did receive uh, some word from... Uh, yeah, we're going to yeah. have open phones today. There's, yes. uh, uh, yeah, the yeah. Mansfield Center had a scheduling conflict. And uh, and I guess uh, someone was supposed to call yesterday, but that didn't <laughs> happen. But those, these things happen. And yeah, so it, no no worries. We'll... Uh, We'll hopefully get them uh, get them on again next month. I you know bet. that yeah. the guest we were supposed to have um, today, Reverend uh, Rivers, I know he's in town for a dialogue today specifically, but um, hopefully maybe we could have him on the phone at a later date and, uh, and yeah, get things rolling. But we're going to just stick with open phones. There's plenty you bet. to talk about. The election is officially a week from today, right. as you've been teasing uh, <laughs> yesterday. Well, I thought so, it was today. So. <laughs> I remember on Friday. Yeah, we, we cleared that up for everybody. But, but yes, no, uh, yeah. we'll, uh, if you guys want to talk about that, and I know we still have uh, two callers on hold right now. But, yeah, whatever you guys want to talk about until Dad gets here in about 45 minutes. That was good. All right, let's uh, jump right in and get. Uh, we're we're nim- if nothing if not nimble around here. So let's get Ed on the line. Ed, good morning. You're on open phone, sir. What's on your mind? Hey, good morning. A couple things about your guest yesterday. Uh, uh, she was kind of rude to one of your callers who was trying to explain the number of properties and the wife, uh, Z- Zinke's wife, uh, owning some California properties through the state of her mother. And and uh, it, and she said, uh, Trainell said, well, I didn't come here to talk about uh, Ryan Zinke. Of course she did. That's all she did is talk about his, uh, how many uh, how many houses he had, his B and B. That's all she did. She just didn't want to have a little clarification of the property mm-hmm. business. Uh, so I thought I thought that was uh, pretty funny. But the second thing is that she's really a five time loser in things she ran for. In 2004, she ran for the PO, uh, PSC and lost in the Republican primary. Then in 2015, she lost an election for the Helena City Commission. Then in 2020, she lost to the PSC again, this time, I think, running as a Democrat. Then she, in 2022, lost the House seat to Zinke. And, uh, oh, and in the meantime, she applied uh, to the county commissioners for a Montana Senate seat when one became vacant. And she lost that to, I think it's Shane uh, Marjo. 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 Uh, yes. In yeah. any event, yeah. There's, if she loses this side, it'll be, I think, set a record of six, uh, zero and six 
and <laughs> and things uh, she's run for. Well, you have, and you, there's got to be a reason behind you, it. You have you have to give you have to give her an A for effort because <clears throat> I, I I don't know very many people who have run as hard. And as, you know, uh, as consistently as, as Monica Trinnell. I mean, she's, she really has. And, and, uh, you, you have to give her credit for out there. She believes in what she's doing. And she, uh, came very, very close two years ago to defeating uh, Ryan Zinke. So, uh, hey, um, is, it's up to her if she wants to, uh, she and, and the people who support her want to spend the money to, Right. Uh, help, help them. That, that's the American way. That, that's, that's how we elect our, uh, our officials. Nobody else probably wants to run for these offices, uh, but I I predict a zero and six record. <laughs> well, we'll see. Okay, all right. Yeah. And today, by the way, is one week from election day, and so I'm hoping that everybody is either you've already voted or you plan to vote on election day. Now I remember. Um, yes. Is it too late? Because I know you talk with Bradley Seaman. Is now too late to? mail in our ballots if we drop it in the mailbox because i know that week threshold yes is usually kind of around that time but yeah. i don't know what they said they, they are encouraging you not to try to mail it uh under seven days so so now's the time yeah. to just take it to the election right center or i get you could drop your ballot off at a polling place two day of the election right yes okay. absolutely you're back. All right, well there you go all right so uh and, and i am hoping and you know me, I'm 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 the I'm the <laughs> the evangelist of voting, right? It's just like if 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 you okay, where's my soapbox? Okay. <laughs> uh, if if you don't vote, okay, if you uh, first of all, if you haven't registered to vote, <laughs> and if you are registered to vote and you don't vote, <laughs> you know, I, I please please, if you don't vote, then you don't have after election day. Whoever is in charge, mayor, city council, county commissioners, whatever it might be, you do not have any right to complain because you have not been a citizen. You you have not been a, uh, a participating member of uh, the voting public. So anyway, okay, enough of that. <laughs> All right, let's, let's get Dave's call on before we take a break. David, good morning, sir. You are on Talkback. Thank you for holding. Go ahead, please. Yeah, yes, I'd like to talk about Ryan Zinke and and his. He was honorable in the military. I, I give him credit for everything he did in the military. But does that make him a, a great American hero now? You know, the first American hero of of a, mm. our revolution, and he may be the greatest one. He, he risked his life and was shot and carried from the battlefield. So he was a great American hero early on. And uh, But times have changed. You know, that, that individual was well known as Benedict Arnold. Right. And as far as, as Zinke goes, him supporting, but not supporting Ukraine supports Russia. And Russia, you ask any Russian soldier, and they are, they are fighting against America. And if you're supporting Russia, you're, you're not an American, in my view. And, and he should, he should change his a position or get out of the election. <laughs> well, that's that's one that's one issue, Dave. Right. So, so, so are you are you a one issue candidate? Or voter? I'm, I'm sorry. Are you a one issue voter? Primarily, Americans should f- support Americans, and uh, that's that's number one issue. And he and when he's doing his campaigning, he's wrapping himself around the flag, saying he's he's a great American, and and I really question that premise when he won't support ukraine all right thanks for the call appreciate it we're we are up against a break and we have brian waiting by the way it's open phones from now until nine o'clock this morning and then uh, dr mirdad key will be here in the studio with professor amir al-azam a, a visiting syrian scholar we're gonna have a great conversation with them uh, here in the studio from 9 to 10. So we're definitely looking forward to that. But right now, we're looking forward to you. If you have a question or a comment, uh, something you'd like to share with everybody, uh, we had great guests yesterday. David Moore was on with uh, No Camp uh, Missoula and No Camping in the Parks. And uh, we had a great conversation with him. If you wanted to comment on that, you could do that too. 721-1290 is our number. 1-800-568-530. Now we're coming back right after this. 
the facts. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. It's open phones from now until 9 o'clock, so we have several phone lines open in addition to the KGVO app. You can hit the message us button, and we'll be happy to share that, too. So, Brian has been waiting. Brian, good morning, sir. You're on Talkback. What's on your mind, please? Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. Well, on a later note, I heard some good news. Uh, the NRA gave Tester an F, <laughs> which... Uh, yes. I think is the perfect grade for him. He uh, voted to confirm the most liberal Supreme Court justice, anti-gun justice ever. He uh, supports red flag laws where the government can just come into your house and take your gun with no sort of due process or anything like that. He partnered with the Brady Pack, the top anti-gun lobbying group in the country. And, uh, yeah, I think he fully deserves that grade, and I'm glad to know that uh, we can trust the NRA's grading system. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add? That's it. All right. Well, thanks for the call. Uh, oh, no, go yeah, ahead, please. It. Please, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to make a comment about Monica Trinnell. It seems to me that she's a socialist. She supports private property rights, but with all the government oversight and regulation, you can imagine. And I think that's socialism, isn't it? Well, it depends on your definition of socialism. If, if you know, the, when the government yeah, controls uh, everything, that's socialism. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but that's my view on it. Well, thank you for the call, sir. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for the yeah. call. Uh, Mr. Wingnut is waiting in the wings right now. Good morning, Mr. Mr. Wingnut. Good morning. Uh, well, you're on Talkback. Go ahead, please. Well, good morning. Yeah, uh, when Ryan uh, Busey was on, he again made the statement that uh, CI 127 would take 50% of the vote in order for the candidate to win. And that's clearly not true the section three uh which would cover his office says that if two or three um two or three people are in the race that the one who gets the majority of the vote is the one who's elected my second comment since it's been a while since we've had open phones is we had a gentleman call in with the premise that Walt should put Republican uh, on his name or on his business, and that was somehow analogous to uh, a candidate putting their political affiliation on uh, behind their office, say, especially for uh, judicial nominees. And where that really is uh, falls apart is, you know, Walt is a private business who offers a business to whoever would like to hire him to do their taxes. And I'm sure he does that irrespective of what their pol political affiliation is. I happen to know that to be true. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. However, if a person is running for office, he's actually doing business for everybody, whether they choose to do business with, with that candidate or not. He is representing everyone. So it's not in any wise, you know, uh, analogous. Uh, and that is why it's also useful to know what the political affiliation of a, of a candidate is, because in, in part, it's kind of like a, a litmus, lit, litmus test for uh, the general beliefs of that candidate. And it really helps the voters to get an idea of what kind of positions or um, what kind of even legal positions it can be particular candidate is going to have well i, I will so, tell i will tell you this that the, in in my opinion uh, you you've just def given my definition of a statesman a statesman or stateswoman is someone who uh whether they run as a republican or a democrat is going to represent everyone in their district no, no matter what their political bent whether it's a d and r or an i behind their name if they if they come to you with a problem uh you are the desig you are the elected representative in in whatever uh, mode of government service you are and it's your duty to serve them to the best of your possible ability 100 percent. and the unfortunate fact of the matter is is there are seem to be fewer and fewer states <laughs> running for office 
So, anyway, I'll let somebody else have a whack at it. Thanks. So, thanks thank for you. the call. We appreciate it. We're up against a break. We have Rick, Catherine, and Tim all standing by, and you guys are taking advantage of of of, of kind of a, uh, a last minute open phone session, and we really appreciate you uh, calling in this morning. You can also use the KGVO app to message in your uh, uh, your whatever you'd like to talk about. And again, our number seven two one twelve ninety. Back right after this. This is. Dennis Bragg with your town square weather. A chance of rain or higher elevation snow showers early today. Otherwise, partly sunny and cool again with highs in the mid-40s. Clearing skies bring the formation of some valley fog Wednesday morning with temperatures into the teens and low 20s, but then warming into the upper 40s under sunny skies. Our next major weather system starts to have impacts later Thursday with a chance of rain or higher elevation snow showers and then a possible rain-snow mix down into the valleys Thursday night into Friday morning. Hey, thank you so much for taking advantage of open phones. Ladies and gentlemen, you sure appreciate it. Uh, let's get right back to it. And Rick has been waiting the longest. Rick, good morning, sir. You are on TalkBack. What's on your mind? Hey, thank you. Uh, I'll try to explain this without getting too angry. Uh, yesterday's uh, program with Monica really did make me angry. Um, my advice to her is that instead of running for office as many times and spending as much money, if she wants cheap and reasonable housing, she should be like the rest of some of us who have leveraged a lifetime of, uh, of, uh, of money. Um, go and have her supporters buy up property, build houses, rent them for whatever they feel like is fair. And instead of trying to mandate to us that have leveraged ourselves of, of, of what we can do with our properties, um, I don't know where this stops. I don't know if she got into office and she got her mandates going. She could do this to hotels, to private campgrounds, because they're open properties. Uh, she really opened up a lot of people's eyes yesterday about how far left she really is, how much of a Marxist that she's walking the line to. And my, my comment is, if you want to walk the walk, leverage yourself. Do what you think is right with your own money. Thank you. All right. Thanks for the call. We appreciate it. That's what Open Phones is all about. And thank you for your comment. Catherine is up next. Catherine, good morning, ma'am. You're on TalkBack. What's up? Yeah, good morning. Um, I've been concerned uh, increasingly about the uh, amount of the use of jealousy and envy as a tool against political opponents. Uh, You know, those are the seven deadlies, one of the seven deadlies. Right. Um. Tester and Monica have both been guilty of this. It goes along with the concept of equity, which is being pushed, which um, I think is dangerous to America because equity means that no one person should have more than anyone else. And that sounds a lot like the old Soviet or communist saying, from each according to their ability to each according to their need, doesn't it? It does. It does strike a familiar chord. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Anyway, that's all that I had to say. Um, it's It's been a really nasty, dirty um, political season so far. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and we still got another week, don't we? <laughs> yeah, yes. we have another week. You yeah. know, the other thing I've noticed, too, is John Tester, I don't know if you remember this, but back in 2006, about the same time in the election cycle, he... Uh, issued a, a, a real um, a devastating attack on uh, Conrad Burns that um, resolved itself, of course, after the election. Um, and uh, he's done the same thing to uh, to his opponent, to uh, Tim Sheehy, this cycle. Um, and I hope it does not work. Um, I admire Tim Sheehy a lot because he's done... He, he, Navy SEAL uh, built a wonderful wildfire uh, business, uh, fighting business, um, employing uh, veterans um, in Montana and is also involved in um, starting a uh, processing um, facility uh, in eastern Montana for livestock, which is uh, a real need um, because right now, of course, there's only four um, processing um, companies left in the world and there are mostly mostly overseas so uh yeah i admire him a lot and i hope he gets in 
Well, I, I will. I will say, uh, and Catherine, I, I, I know what, what you're talking about in political parlay is called the October surprise, right? Uh, yes. They, they yes, usually, the, if, if they have something in hand and they know that it's going to be devastating, whether it can be proven or unproven, um, and, and they wait until maybe mid-October and then boom, they, they drop it. Yeah. And, and uh, that, that creates a lot of negative energy to, toward whomever it is, whether it's true or not, right? And, exactly. and, and of course, sometimes exactly. sometimes it takes you know months and months and months to get all the paperwork together. Well, you see, I told oh, oh, oh gee, sorry about that. Um, anyway, yeah, right. But but by the, but by then the damage is done. And and to me, yeah, exactly. uh, it, that, that that's one of the things about politics that I truly despise. It's it's the October surprise. Oh, I know. Yeah, I mean, there uh, um, he's he's accusing uh, Sheehy of uh, stolen valor, which I right. find absolutely. Absolutely despicable. So, but kind of goes along with his uh, method of uh, campaigning. So, it it it, anyway. it it would it would have been different if Mr. Tester himself had had served in the military, but he couldn't because of exactly. because of his disability, you know. But uh, uh, I I I just I, I don't know. I come from a military family. I, I'm the only one in my family that right. didn't serve. Right. So I, I'm really That's sensitive. Right. Uh, for for people who have who have taken the time to serve their country and uh, go go through that sacrifice, um, I lived it as a kid, and uh, I, I have great respect for it. No matter no matter what branch of service or how long they served, so yeah, right, right, exactly, same here. So anyway, thank you, Catherine. Thanks for the call. We appreciate it. All right, Tim is uh, up next. Uh, Tim, good morning, sir. You're on Talkback. What's on your mind, please? Oh yeah, good morning, Peter. Yes, uh, well, everybody's talking about politics this morning, and uh, there's been a lot of things uh, listening to politics for the last few months. And, and uh, but there's one big story, and it's an absolute horror story that uh, really, really disturbing. And that is the story that uh, Donald Trump brought up uh, on one of his speeches, and has been brought up, but it's not at the top of the news story. And that is, there are 325,000 missing children uh, because of the uh, terrible uh, Biden-Harris border policy. It's turning this country into a third world country and turning it into a pedophile. Uh, uh, the pedophiles uh, you know, are running loose. We don't know if these children are uh, missing because of an admin error from accounting but uh the possibility of pedophiles uh and uh we've heard about it no no may, may, may i ask you to clarify are you talking about three hundred twenty-five thousand uh children of immigrants who have come across the border or three hundred twenty-five thousand yeah. children uh who are native to america who are, have gone missing oh no because of the border policy oh, I, see. Got I got you okay. immigrant children okay uh yeah this would be a top story i've read there's some of it out there, but it's really not. It's, uh, you know, of course, the big media is keeping it quiet. Well, I, I will tell you this. I will tell you this, uh, Tim, the, the fact that uh, when, when, when we see uh, many of the uh, news reports of people streaming through these open fences... And and there are families. There's moms and dads, and there's they have children, and there some some are carrying uh, carrying infants, and 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 you're thinking, Lord, what? I I, I can't even imagine a more difficult a more difficult way to start your life. Yes, it's yes, it's very tough, and uh, they owe money to the cartels, and uh, well, one way I'm, I'm assuming is they sell their children. Um, to the cartels because uh, they owe money to get across the border. It costs thousands of dollars, which, you know, poverty-stricken country they don't have. So, yes, it's a tough, very tough... It is It is heartbreaking. And, it is, yeah. And, and so I wish that uh, the people would bring this to life or bring this, uh, make this a top story about All right. where are these children... You bet. What's going on at the border? Tim, thank you for your call. Uh, we appreciate it. We're going to well, come. Just, Go ahead, quick. Say one more thing about politics here. Is, uh, I heard there's uh, two things in politics that you cannot survive, and that is being caught with a dead girl or a live boy. 
uh, one thing I've heard. Of. Okay. Yes. Okay. I don't know what that means, but that's all right. We'll yeah. come right back. We have Jeff and Emmett standing by. Uh, 721-1290 is our number. 1-800-568-5309. Uh, you have a question or comment? It's open phones. From now until 9 o'clock. And then uh, Dr. Mirdad Kia, University of Montana, will be uh, bringing with him a, a, a very um, prestigious Syrian scholar, Professor Amir Al-Azam, who will be joining us here in the studio, taking your phone calls from 9 to 10. So we'll be right back after this. Need to replace your Social Security card? In most states, you can request one online with a My Social Security account. A My Social Security account gives you secure access to your personal earnings history and benefit status. You can also get a proof of income letter, estimate and apply for benefits, and more. Save time. Go online. Open a My Social Security account at ssa.gov slash myaccount. Social Security. Securing today and tomorrow. Produced at U.S. taxpayer expense. Hey, welcome back to Talk back it's open phones whatever might be on your mind this morning for the next oh 16 minutes or so that's uh, what we've uh, we've got the phones open for and lots of folks calling in jeff is next jeff good morning sir you're on talk back what's up hey good morning peter good morning nick good morning montana an earlier caller it might have been skip i'm not sure i uh, brought up the fact that monica Chanel has has run multiple times and never won oh for five i think he had her and that's a point I've made here on the show before. Is, um, I like to think of her humorously as the Beto O'Rourke of Montana. Because if you remember Beto, he he ran for governor, he ran for Senate. Um, he's twice, I think, he ran for senator. Um, he's run for everything in, in, in Texas and never won anything there. And so uh, I think that's kind of the, the same path Monica's on. Is I don't know what she's trying to do. I think she's trying to prove herself in some way. Um, but the people in Montana aren't buying it. She is a full-blown uh, Marxist. I mean, that term a lot of folks take exception to, but Mar- as you guys a- aptly pointed out, you know, uh, D.I.E., the Jedi program in the, in the county, uh, all that stuff has Marxist roots, you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. And, and it's all basically based on envy and, uh, so I just, I just kind of, you know, I want to kind of foot stomp that. And then uh, earlier, uh, when you had Ryan Bussey on, I challenged him about property taxes, and he kept asserting that Governor Gene Forte had raised property taxes on people, and he hasn't. That's that's the the big lie of the campaign is that we are paying more in property taxes because Governor Gene Forte did something, and he completely dismissed the fact that cities and counties set their own budgets. Lake County has set its budget here, and its mill levy rate is completely different than Missoula County. That's despite what the state sets as the mill as a tax rate. So it's a combination of tax rate and mill levies. And cities and counties set their budgets and then... uh, tax their citizens accordingly. And he ha- would have none of that. I, when I challenged him and tried to ask him where on my property tax bill is the line item for government, for uh, state government, he couldn't point it out. He just kept asserting that it's there, it's there, and it's not. I encourage everybody, take a look at your 2024 tax bill. You will see if it's anything like the one we have. Right. At the very top are all the school levies. Right. And then... There's county levy, and then there's city levy. And and none of that goes to the general fund in the state. As a matter of fact, the refund that we got for property taxes did not come out of property tax money. They came out of excess funds in the general fund, which all came from income taxes and other fees and things. So it's, it's just completely erroneous, just completely wrong and a complete lie and sham that Governor Jean Forte is the reason why your property taxes are high. Our property values went up. I mean, the house we live in has increased immensely, and I'm grateful for the increase in value. Um, I'm not all that grateful for the increase in property taxes, but it's necessary. And up here, I think our county commissioners do a good job of, of keeping that as low as possible. And I wish I could say the same for the Missoula County Commissioner. And I've noticed that they're not, They've kind of been hesitant to come on your 
your show recently, Peter, and I know they have... Well, no, they, they, they were on what, with... just a couple of weeks ago? Nick, right? Ryan Bussey? Yeah, but, no, but no, the, the, the county commissioners. Oh, yeah, they were on... Uh, on County Talk. They were on the 2nd of the of October, and we usually get them about every two or three months with their schedule, so so that's about right, yeah. Right, but uh, but they were not willing to talk about it. I can't remember what the issue was. Yeah, it was good. we were talking about the floodplain. Uh, they, they were talking. They were here with their yeah, flood, right. floodplain manager. Yeah, right. So, uh, but so that they weren't willing to talk about it. Well, I can understand that the uh, that the uh, topic would, wouldn't change. So I'm not criticizing you at all for that. I, I just have to commend you too, Peter. Finally, that. Uh, uh, when Monica was making her points, you did keep pushing back on her, but what are the details? I think you asked that three or four times. Excuse me. And she ostensibly gave you details and quotes, but I didn't really hear anything of substance. So just good on you for pushing back. Yeah. Appreciate that. By, by the way, speaking of property, and thanks for the call, Jeff. Uh, by the way, um, speaking of property taxes, I will be speaking with Tyler Gurnant today. He's a Missoula uh, uh, City County uh, treasurer, and he is. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the second half of your property taxes, which are due at the end of next month, at the end of November. So, yeah, uh, and we'll be talking about that. If you remember all the hubbub that came with the first half when we first encountered that the, the new valuations and there were there was lots of uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth and so we'll we'll be paying the second half here in just a little while um let's see let's go ahead and get Emmett on the line Emmett good morning <laughs> sir you are on talk back what's up sir oh thanks for taking my call <clears throat> you know well anyway i kind of wanted to sw- switch gears a little bit um i i have had a question on my mind that i've been kind of not really bothering me, but I'm kind of curious. You know, most of us that listen to talk back and listen to a conservative radio station like yours are not marijuana smokers. Uh, so why are there so many cannabis ads that you run on KGVO? None of us want that product. I mean, maybe there are a few. I don't know. I well, don't smoke well, uh, marijuana. Let, listen, hold, hold on, Emmett. Hold on just a second. Obviously, mm. uh, we have, uh, what, 54 Something like that. Uh, cannabis, uh, cannabis dispensaries. In, Fifty-seven was the last one. Fifty-seven. Right, so, uh, there yeah. fifty, which is like triple the amount of any other city in Montana. Yeah, they put that temporary yeah. moratorium on them. Right. So, it's, yeah. so, so we can't have any more for a while. So obviously, it's a very popular product. And now that it's been legalized, uh, and, and, and you know, if you've listened to me, I, I was totally against the legalization of. Of recreational marijuana, yeah, yeah. but it was passed anyway, and so now it's the law. Yeah. And now, and now, um, we have uh, a lot of people who are making their living and providing jobs and paying taxes by selling recreational marijuana. So there you go. Interesting. Well, that's my first question. I had, I'm thanks for asking, asking, answering that question. Second of all, I do want to promote voting early. I went down on Friday. And voted early. I'm, you know, I'm an I'm an independent, not Democrat nor Republican, but I had to vote Republican just straight down all this year. I'm so furious with what they're doing to Donald Trump, and the Biden Harris administration has ruined everything. So I wanted to show Democrats the door. It was it wasn't even a second, you know, a question or thought that came into my mind. It was straight Republican this year. I'm, but I might have gotten my cold down there at the election office, but. It's important to vote early because I do have a cold, or I'm on the last stages of a cold, and I'm sure I'm going to be fine by Election Day. I don't have to uh, vote now, but what if you were sick, really sick, and you couldn't get down to the polls or needed someone to give you an absentee ballot? If you're feeling well and this election counts, you can you know go down to the elections office and vote. That way, if you're in my situation in the next, in the next couple of days and you got sick like I did, and I'm still getting over it, you can tell it by my throat, uh, by the way I sound. I don't sound the best, you know. Yeah, it's just really important. All right, buddy. Listen, you you lay down, take care of yourself, and thanks for the call. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you don't feel well. We're going to come right back. We have Harry, Andy, and Sandy all waiting in the last, oh, eight minutes of open phones. We're going to come right back after this quick time out. 
You know, hey, welcome back to Talk Back. 721-1290 is our number. 1-800-568-5309. Open phones continues. And let me just go ahead and push a button here. We'll get Harry on the line. Harry, good morning. You're on Talk Back, sir. What's up? Yeah, good morning, Peter. Uh, first off, just uh, people throw these terms, socialists, Marxists, Nazis around. And, you know, it, I don't think they know what they mean. I mean, they... they have the idea that well, what the other person is, they're bad, so they have to be whatever I think you know, whatever bad term I can think of, you know, uh, you know this. There, there's a definition. There's a definition to each one of them, and um, none of them really, far I can see, uh, uh, applies. But uh, my really called about is the um, the I twenty six and I twenty seven. They uh, first of all, one the I I uh, one or Y one twenty six is uh, I I understand that the Party people like it, but they they got well, like Sheehy. How? Where did he come from? Who is he? Never heard of him until he's running now. But he he uh, we had people like Rosendale, well known. They kicked him to the curb because the party people didn't want him. So I mean, the you know this. I would think the Republicans would be kind of mad that the you know, had the National Party come in and just gave them their this is our golden hair or our golden boy and you know, sort of pushed it down their throats and. Without them really, you know, having much say, they had several other people running that were state legislators. Didn't you know they fairly well known? Or at least I, I've heard of them, and they just, you know, she he just sort of was. He's our guy, so you know, the heck with the rest of them. And the one I one twenty seven, um, I don't understand why they're making a big deal about that. Didn't I'm I'm pretty sure that our legislature had a bill. They tried to pass a bill almost exactly the same that said. The winner had to have more than fifty percent, and I because I remember when they did it, I thought, well, this what the reason they're doing this is because Tester had won uh, one of the things earlier with less than fifty percent, so this was sort of a way to get past that, and it didn't pass at the time. But now it's oh, it's the worst thing ever, you know. I it's I and I don't understand what the big deal is because let's if the person doesn't get fifty percent, the Montana legislature gets to de- decide how you know if it's a runoff or whatever. And most likely it's going to be a runoff, and so it's going to be whoever, you know, the probably the Republican or whatever win anyhow. So I mean, it's because the Republicans are going to be in charge of the legislature again. I don't know why they're getting their, you know, knickers and not about it. But uh, Harry, Harry, we, we, we got to yeah. run. But thank, yeah, you know, you got other, okay, yeah, thank, thanks for the call. We thanks have time to get Andy on. Andy, real quick, we've got about a minute and a half, sir. Please go ahead. What's on your mind? Uh, good morning. Thanks for taking my call, gentlemen. Uh, just a couple of points. Uh, so Zinke was the interior secretary for just one year, and he resigned in disgrace with over eight or 18 federal investigations uh, uh, under him. Um, and the investigators found that he had uh, questionable ethics. Um, another point I want to make is our border situation wouldn't be nearly as bad as it is now if Trump hadn't killed the border bill. So that's he killed it in order to keep it a contentious issue, which it is now, um, but it could have been dealt with uh, a year ago. Uh, pointing out about Jim Forte, uh, as a hunter here in Montana for over 30 years, I've never had a violation. Um, I've never poached anything, never tried to, but he poached a wolf, um, kind of an iconic species here in Montana. Uh, controversial, but you know, poaching is poaching. It was, it was, it, it was, he, 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 he snared it. Uh, and, and, and a, a yeah, lot well, of, a, a lot of the outrage came from the fact that it was snared and then he had to shoot it. So. Yeah. If I snared a bull elk, I think I'd be guilty of poaching and people would have, would have a right to be uh, upset with that too. Um, and she, uh, you know, he shoots himself and says, it says it's, he got it in Afghanistan. That is That's, the allegation. Talk about stolen power. That's the allegation which he, which you know, people in his troop have come forward and said that didn't happen. So, you know, he's he's lying to us. So if he lied to us already and we elect him, is he going to lie to us again? I think so. 
All right. Thanks. So those are my comments. Thanks. thanks. Thanks for the call. And unfortunately, we don't have time to get Sandy's call in. We apologize for that. I wish we could. But we are going to take a break. And when we come back after the top of the hour, we have special guests in the studio. Our good friend, Dr. Mirdad Kia from the University of Montana, will be welcoming Professor Amir Al-Azam, a Syrian scholar who is in Missoula, uh, especially at the University of Montana. We'll be talking with them for the next hour. So gear up. We'll be back after the top of the hour. This is Talkback, 721-1290 or 1-800-568-5309. This is News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM, KGVO, Missoula's news and weather station. Hey, welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good to have you back. It is uh, the Tuesday, October 29th edition, part two, the nine o'clock hour. And of course, the Talkback this morning is brought to you by Y West Storage out of the Y on two small way for pricing and availability. Do they have a storage unit for you? I bet they do. Call 406-510-0590. Y West, they're making room for you. Phillips Janitorial with residential and commercial cleaning. No job being too big or small. Their number, 406-260-6617 for Phillips Janitorial. 123 Seamless Gutters is a family-owned and operated business, and they do handle everything that has to do with gutters so you don't have to. Especially with the weather coming up, call 406-240-2669, protecting the foundation of your future. And by Harrington Surgical Supply, where their mission remains the same, to restore competence and comfort into your daily life. The views and opinions expressed on TalkBack are not those of the staff, management, or advertisers. Okay, welcome aboard, everybody. We have uh, special guests in the studio this morning. First of all, Mr. Nick, good morning, sir. Good morning. Nick Christensen over there, producing TalkBack, taking your phone calls. And here in the studio, one of, one of our dear friends, uh, of the program, uh, Dr. Mirdad Kia, uh, professor of history at the University of Montana. And you have a special guest uh, back in the studio with us. So go ahead, please. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Nick. Thank you very much for having us. And uh, we are today truly privileged and honored to have one of uh, really uh, internationally recognized scholars in the area of Middle Eastern history and anthropology uh, Professor Amr Al-Azam, and he is uh, is not a newcomer here. Uh, he has been with us he's before. A, a frequent flyer. And he's a very, very popular uh, speaker. Um, um, Professor Al-Azam has been with us before during our conferences. And, um, of course, uh, during this visit, we thought what a great opportunity uh, to have him connect with the uh, greater Missoula community and share uh, some of his uh, interpretations and some of his information about the recent events in uh, that part of the world, which is going through a great deal of change, great deal of transition as we speak. As you know, um, October 7th was a turning point in some ways when Hamas attacked Israel and then Israel retaliated, of course, and uh, um, more than a year later, uh, the entire leadership of Hamas has been, uh, I don't want to use the verb, but decapitated more or less. It has disappeared. But the war has now spilled into other arenas. Um, Israel has also um, more or less uh, removed, the, eliminated the leadership of Hezbollah, the party of God in Lebanon, uh, everybody calls Hezbollah a proxy of the Islamic regime in Iran. I call it just an extension uh, of Iran's revolutionary guards and intelligence services. That has disappeared. And uh, now the battle is actually between Iran and Israel itself. And uh, so we wanted to, to uh, hear the opinion of a leading scholar in the field. Um, so I wanted first, though, to ask uh, Professor Azam to to tell us a little bit about the situation in Syria itself, because um, you know we do, we used to hear a lot about the civil war, uh, but less and less today. Though Syria is one of the battlefields uh, between the contending forces, please. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, very glowing uh, introduction. <laughs> I already feel uh, three times larger than I usually. No. Much deserved. No, well, thank you. Anyway, but um, w- with regards to Syria, and you're quite right to kind of bring that up, um, 
the situation is that ever since the uh, kind of point from 2018 onwards, we entered into what would be called a frozen conflict. Um, different regions of Syria were under control directly or indirectly of various uh, regional or international powers. You have eastern Syria under the control of the Kurds who are supported by the United States, obviously. You have uh, northwest Syria, which is under the control of uh, one of the local um, uh, rebel groups. Uh, we refer to it as HTS. And, uh, and their proxies are supported by the uh, Turk, Turkish government, the, Tur- the Turks, and then uh, you have different parts, and then you have the Iranians and the Russians controlling other parts and supporting the Assad regime there, and that's that's how it's been. The thing that's now changing is the fact that the Israelis, uh, after, of course, October 7th, have decided to essentially dismantle the networks that are acting as supply routes. And Syria is a very important supply route, and that's where the next problem is going to be, how the Israelis now are going to start hitting very hard. They, they've already been hitting these targets for quite some time, but now they're going to intensify this, and I think we're going to see more and more of this activity, especially in the areas under either Hezbollah or Iranian Shiite proxy groups who are Iraqi um, to be targeted. So when we come back... And we are about to go to a break. Um, I want to ask you basically about ISIS, whether it still exists and right. in what shape or form, because that's one of the concerns that I think are some of we our... We haven't heard much have. about ISIS recently. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it was, you know, badly damaged, but... There's also news that they are still operative on the ground in Syria sure. in certain areas. Yes. But we should probably right. take a break and yes. come back. We will yeah. we'll take a break. By the way, our phone lines are open. And I know you're listening in rapt attention uh, to uh, to Dr. Aldazam, uh, who is here in the studio with us. Of course, Dr. Kia as well. We'd love to have your thoughts and comments and questions. 721-1290 is our number. 1-800-568-5309. We're coming right back after this. Dennis Bragg with your town square weather. A chance of rain or higher elevation snow showers early today. Otherwise, partly sunny and cool again with highs in the mid-40s. Clearing skies bring the formation of some valley fog Wednesday morning with temperatures into the teens and low 20s, but then warming into the upper 40s under sunny skies. Our next major weather system starts to have impacts later Thursday with a chance of rain or higher elevation snow showers and then a possible rain-snow mix down into the valleys Thursday night into Friday morning. Welcome back, everybody. And, uh, I guess we are, we are thrilled, by the way, to have with us Dr. Mirdad Key here in the studio and his special guest, a Syrian scholar, uh, and Dr. Professor Amir Al-Azam joining us here in the studio, Dr. Azam. Yeah. And so, uh, Dr. Key, go ahead, please. Yeah. So we were talking about, uh, you know, ISIS and whether it's still operated, uh, in, inside Syria. And the, the news has it that, uh, you know, remember that in the beginning, there were a lot of fighters uh, coming from various European countries. You know, these were volunteers, Islamists. And uh, Turkey, more or less, had left its border with Syria open. And they were coming and joining various ISIS units. But uh, after it was uh, crushed, basically, uh, uh, especially under um, uh, Trump administration... It seems that that flow of folks coming from Europe has subsided, and now it has become more local tribes, local uh, communities, but it's still operative at this point. Yeah, yes. I mean, obviously, after the, the, the termination of ISIS in the, in the big battle at Baghouz yeah. and the killing of uh, al-Baghdadi, obviously ISIS went into hibernation deep into the desert parts of, of Syria and kind of stayed there for pretty much all this while, occasionally coming out, maybe doing a raid here, a raid there. The concern for us now is that once the Israelis shift their campaign to the fore and targeting those supply lines and those areas that are connecting between Iraq and uh, obviously Lebanon to resupply Hezbollah, that will create enough of a disruption to maybe uh, cause a power vacuum. And in power vacuums, these are the times, these are the uh, situations that provide the kind of opportunities a group like ISIS will want to reemerge and start to increase its attacks. Nature we, abhors a vacuum, right? Exactly. Right. And, 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 and uh, this, this forthcoming, if you will, extension of the conflict is 
uh, is likely to create such a vacuum in those areas because that's where a lot of the bombardment is going to be focused in addition to other areas that has, um, Hezbollah has either a presence or a focus inside Syria. The Israelis are going to go after those. Yeah. And in that ensuing vacuum, there might be opportunities for ISIS to reemerge. I don't know how much of a threat internationally they're going to be at this yeah. moment. Um, there are other iterations of ISIS, like in Afghanistan with yeah. ISKP, and that has been much more in the news and in focus, you know, with the Moscow attack, with their um, Turk, you know, the, the attacks in Istanbul, etc. Yeah. I think those are more worrying for me right now than specifically ISIS in Syria. But yeah. we wait to see what happens. It, it's a most unusual war in, in that Israel is being, if you will, uh, highly selective mm-hmm. about about the targets that it's going after mm-hmm. with with the specific, as you have very patiently explained to me, mm-hmm. with, with, with the specific uh, task of hitting only military targets and leaving civilian and infrastructure alone. <laughs> yep. And, and uh, when, when you talk about war, the, that is, that very rarely happens because uh, wars, you know, kill people and break things. And so... Anyway, uh, it's it's very different. Yeah, in the case of Iran, clearly, this a uh, few days ago, uh, they actually, and I think under pressure from the Biden administration, they uh, avoided uh, oil installations, uh, petroleum, gas. The price uh, of oil refiners. actually went down. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, of course, the nuclear, you know, development sites, uh, the military sites, especially belonging to Revolutionary Guards and Iranian Armed Forces, were the principal targets. But what was astonishing, and I wanted you to <clears throat> sort of uh, maybe comment on that, Amir, is that uh, with all these bruraha about uh, ballistic missiles and all kinds of mm-hmm. weaponized drones that Iran claims to be, the skies of Iran were pretty open uh, to uh, the Israeli Air Force, and it shows that Iran lacking a real Air Force their jet fighters are as old as the 1979 revolution, were pretty much exposed to all kinds of attacks from the Israelis. Yeah, no, for sure. But I just want to clarify one point Peter was just saying. Please. Uh, the, uh, specifically about that, uh, you know, highly specialized targeting of uh, military installations, etc. only. That only applies to the attack on Iran. Yeah. It doesn't right. apply to Gaza. It doesn't apply gotcha. to southern Lebanon. I understand. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, but going back to what you're saying, um, Medad, yes, uh, there's no, I don't think anyone, even the Iranians, would dream of saying that they have a highly sophisticated advanced no. um, air defense system. Um, that was never the issue. But they did have some, you know, advanced S300 and even S400 sort of missile batteries that could be and would have been a threat to any inbound um, and those attack. are russian made right and those are these are these are russian made uh-huh. yes now um what i've heard and there's been very little information following the attack obviously but recent reporting has said that the israelis specifically targeted what was there in terms of air defenses and took out a lot of those s300 batteries that do protect the um, nuclear facilities and those oil installations. And Mm. that kind of makes some of us think that this was a preparatory strike. So this is not the real big strike. This is a preparatory strike for the big strike that may come if you get a Trump administration winning, then Netanyahu will feel able to kind of go in with that. Um, But the fact that the Israelis were able to go in and and do some extensive damage, far more than what the Iranians are claiming, is, is kind of beginning to come out and and it will be revealing in for us in in due course and um, you know going back to the arab middle east what about lebanon because uh, you know here is this country uh, which has always been so closely its fate has been closely tied to syria um, and its population um, really overwhelming majority have nothing to do with the conflict with Israel, you know, uh, from the Maronites to the Sunni Muslims to the Druze and so on and so forth, other communities. But it has a problem with Hezbollah, and that because of the Iranian uh, regime's backing and arming of Hezbollah. But Lebanon has been paying a very heavy price as a result of this. What is your assessment of the situation inside Lebanon now? I mean... (laughs) The, the Lebanese have essentially, as you quite 
you know, rightly put it, have, have basically been um, hostages, held hostage to a conflict that has is now being played out between Israel and Iran, and but being fought on Lebanese soil. The thing to consider, and we can talk about that more um, as we go along today, is that really, and, and that's the question, did Hezbollah really want to start a war with Israel in the first place? And just to be fair, not that one would be one thing to be fair to them, but to be fair to them on that one, in this partic- specific instance, they did not want a war with with Israel. In fact, when Sinwar, as reported, who is the leader of Hamas, who is now dead, obviously, came to the Iranians and the Hezbollah in 2022 and put forward this plan to them, they basically told him, no, that's a bad idea. And he went ahead and did it in 2024, October 7, 2024. So... Hezbollah has always been a very reluctant, um, if you will, uh, its involvement has been reluctant. And we can see that and it slowly and but gradually escalates and, 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 and that brings a catastrophic outcome in the end to Hezbollah. Hezbollah has taken a terrible, it, 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 uh, most people who understand and study Hezbollah will tell you this was a catastrophic mistake for them and they may not recover from it. We're going to come right back. 721-1290 is our number. And we do have Helena waiting to visit with both of you. So, Mirror, you might need your headphones for that. We're going to come right back. Uh, our phone lines are open. Our guests, uh, Dr. Mir Kia and Professor Amir Al-Azam, uh, joining us here in the studio this morning. And we deeply appreciate their being here. We're going to come right back after this. Montana State News Network. I'm Dennis Bragg. Missoula leaders are promising to have some new guidelines for urban camping drawn up in the next month. But the city is also working on a broader strategy for houselessness. During a hearing last week, Community Planning, Development and Innovation Director Aaron Payan said work is underway to have a new draft strategy plan for helping with the houselessness issue also in the next few weeks. It's really designed to provide us more clarity about key areas of focus over the next three to four years and actions that can impact those areas of focus and what that will lead to through implementation is the establishment of a coalition in the community with broad-based participation. The city says during the latest estimate in April, there were 622 households experiencing homelessness every day in Missoula, including 57 families. On the other end of the spectrum, a new report is identifying Helena Valley Northeast as the wealthiest small city in Montana with a median income topping $137,000 a year. Go Banking Rates recently analyzed the most recent Census Bureau data to reach the conclusion that income, even though it's not its own separate town, is considerably higher than Bozeman by comparison, where the median income Income is just over $74,000 a year. Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks increasing the number of available deer tags in the Flathead in hopes of harvesting more animals where recent tests are showing the latest outbreak of chronic wasting disease. CWD just showed up this month raising concerns about the spread of the disease, which impacts deer and even elk. Libby has been a CWD hotspot for the past several years just to the west. Under the change, individual hunters can claim up to two tags for antlerless white-tailed deer in Hunting District 170. The additional licenses can be purchased immediately at local outlets. This is the Montana State News Network. For more on these stories and others around Montana, download the Montana State News app or visit montanastatenews.com. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. At age 30, Carissa finished her high school diploma. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, you can do it. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. If I could be you. And you could be me. For just one hour. If you could find a way. To get inside. Each other's mind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. shoes. We've all felt left out. And for some, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes. Welcome back to Talk Back. 721-1290 is our number. I'm Peter Christian. Nick Christensen is over there taking your phone calls and producing Talk Back every day. Our guests, Dr. Mirdad Kia and Professor Amir Al-Azam, both here in the studio. And Helena has been waiting through the break. Thank you for your patience, ma'am. What's on your mind? Yeah, I had kind of a follow-up question um, for Dr. Al-Azam's discussion of Syria. Um, and that is, if he... 
uh, could illustrate for me what the situation is in Lebanon. Um, I understand that there's no, thankfully, no civil war in Lebanon, but we hear a lot about how Hezbollah controls the area near the border with Israel, the southern part of Lebanon. Is that similar to the kind of control that militias and different um, groups have in, in regions of Syria? And how does it relate to the central government in Lebanon, given that there's so much Hezbollah control? That's my first question. My second question is, how does he see um, lead, new leadership emerging, particularly in Gaza, in the aftermath, when, when this conflict, the armed part of it, uh, finally ends? How does he see a reemergence of Palestinian leadership in the, um, in the void left by Hamas in Gaza? Thank good, you very good, much. Good questions, I, Helena. Thank you. Thanks for the call. Uh, gentlemen, y- please. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your questions. And yes, two very good questions. With regards to Hezbollah uh, and their you know, control in Lebanon, remember Hezbollah uh, is actually part of the Lebanese uh, political uh, landscape as well. They, they, they have uh, members in parliament. <coughs> they actually have uh, cabinet positions, etc. So it's not just simply an armed militia that controls an area outside uh, you know, government uh, oversight. Um, they are actually part of the government. And that's what complicates it uh, all the more. Um, that said, uh, you have a, essentially an arm of the government that also takes its orders directly from Tehran, which really is is at the heart of the problem here. Um, the fact that Hezbollah has been severely weakened, the fact that Hezbollah is only a, a, a is a representative of only part of the larger Shiite. Um, uh, minority population in 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 Lebanon um leaves some wiggle room for a post uh, kind of Hezbollah uh, situation where the Lebanese and the Lebanese government might be able to reclaim its sovereignty over the territories and areas that Hezbollah currently holds and I believe there was a small thing I saw today in the news that said that the Iranians had finally agreed to allow Hezbollah to retreat um, away from the border areas into their enclave strongholds in, in the central and north Bekaa, which could be the start of the loosening up of this. The other question on the leadership in Gaza, well, uh, I don't know. Um, Hamas it was never really as popular as you know people would make it out to be in Gaza, and I've spoken to a lot of people in Gaza over the last 24 months. And you can see that their popularity has really, really declined. Um, is there room for a new leadership to emerge? There should be. And it should be from Gaza itself rather than having it imposed or parachuted upon it either from the West Bank or from outside Gaza. Um, what Gazans really need more than anything else is the support to be able to allow for these people to emerge and also the security for these people to be able to take over and start acting on behalf of their communities without the threat from some armed um, you know, Hamasi guy. Um, that's going to take time. We will see. And that should be the focus of a lot of the negotiations that are going now. Obviously, the, the, the main concern right, right now is how to get the hostages out and, and all that and end fighting. But, once, but they should also be thinking about these issues as they go along because you can't just end the fighting and then have a vacuum there. One thing I've wondered, well, we'll get Jeff's call on in just a moment. The remaining hostages, do uh, is, is there any proof of life there involved? I mean, is there uh, any way that, that uh, the UN or, or other organizations could go in and say they're okay, they're not okay, uh, or what? There is very little information. They're distributed between different factions. In fact, we don't even know how many Hamas actually holds itself because remember, it's not just Hamas down there. And and in just kind of continuing for Helena's point, remember it's not just Hamas; it's also the other um, extremist um, military factions like Islamic Jihad and so on and so forth. So each of these groups is holding, you know, hostages, and getting all that coordinated, especially after now that Sinwar is gone and the entire Hamas leadership is pretty much decimated, is going to be quite hard. And that's, I think, part of the challenge that they are facing right now in the current negotiations. Let's get another call in. Uh, we'll get. We have Jeff waiting on the line. Jeff, good morning. You are on with our guests. Go ahead, please. Hey, good morning. Uh, I was privileged at a young, age, relatively young age, twenty years old, to be able to uh, be introduced to the Middle East. Uh, I had a remote tour in Turkey, and uh, that was uh, very eye-opening for me. Uh, 
And as a matter of fact, a, a young lady that we met there not, is now active in the uh, the anti Erdogan movement in Istanbul. So uh, uh, it's it's I get to watch that from a distance, and I've been a privileged again to visit countries like uh, Kuwait and Abu Dhabi, and particularly in Kuwait City, but also Abu Dhabi. I wandered around freely through neighborhoods. And I never felt any danger there at all, any threat. Um, and yet, and I've also been visited uh, uh, Egypt and uh, and Saudi Arabia. I spent a lifetime in Saudi Arabia one week, and uh, mm-hmm. it was uh, it was completely different, you know, com- uh, completely different in Saudi Arabia, and uh, and even in in Cairo, there were areas that were go in areas that were no go. And, and I just, I want, I, the question I have is kind of from the 50,000 foot level. I said all that because <laughs> Lebanon used to be considered what the Paris of the Middle East. And, uh, and, it, and now, um, it's just in devastation. And what's the difference between these countries? Uh, what is there an underlying, one underlying reason uh, other than Liberty um, but is there something else going on? Is there, I guess I'm asking: Is there a way forward that we can that we could restore Lebanon to some of its former greatness? I mean, you know, uh, it's just it's historic. It's almost mythic what it was, yeah. and it, it just hurts so much to see what it's become. Okay, thanks for the call, Jeff. Go ahead. <laughs> Professor, right. lo- lo- lots there. Well, uh, well yes. Uh, well, yeah. thank you for um, reminding me of uh, mm. Beirut and Lebanon being the Paris of the Middle East. I was born in Beirut, by the way. I grew up there. I went to school there. So I kind of know what you're sort of referring to. The thing is this. The, um, the, much of the, a lot of the Middle East is also... Um, uh, what do you might call uh, the a mirage? So you see something, but it's, you don't really see the whole thing, and you only, <laughs> and you only see what you're supposed to see. So, um, and and specifically the the reference to the Paris of the Middle East. Basically, Beirut back then, and and you know uh, to a certain extent, this this kind of situation still exists even now. Was a, a facade of this Western, you know. Parisian uh, nightlife and fun and, and everything else. But right behind it, um, and just a little further back in, were also the slums that you don't get to see, all right? And, 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 and the deprivation. And civil wars and conflicts don't come out of vacuum or nothing. There's usually a long process of buildup of resentment and, uh, uh, you know, dissatisfaction that ultimately blow up in one way or another. And usually because existing governments, rulers, regimes, etc., constantly ignore the needs of their own people. And ultimately that kind of blows up in their face. And maintaining that balance of just giving enough to keep people quiet and satisfied versus... Um, making sure that they don't have the kind of freedoms and liberties and human rights that we basically take for granted in our part of the world is 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 the trick. Essentially, in most of these countries that you mentioned, with the exception of Turkey, that's a different situation. There is a tr- basic trade off. I, you know, I as a ruler give you um, security that you can walk at three o'clock in the morning and feel totally safe, but in return. All your uh, freedoms, human rights, etc. You have to put those. Yeah, uh, uh, you have to give those to me, and you have no rights. You can't vote. You can't speak out. You, you have no right to object to anything else. And it's that you know that that's the balance that's there. We're going to come right back. Stay with us. Uh, we have Jeff and Dave both waiting to visit with our guests. We'll be right back after this timeout. As Ms. Com. We are back on Talk Back, and uh, the questions continue for our guests. Uh, Dr. Mir Dadkia, Professor Amir Al Azam, a uh, scholar from Syria here visiting, and let's move right along and get Dave. So, Peter, oh, yes, I, I'm yeah, sorry, Mir, yeah. you had something you wanted to say. Go yeah, ahead. No, no. So, building on uh, excellent response from uh, Amir about uh, Jeff's question, I think first and foremost, when it becomes way too confusing, uh, first, I think it would be helpful to sort of streamline it and separate Israel, Turkey, and Iran, the three non-Arab countries from the equation. Um, Iran, very unique with its own history, culture, language, whatever. 
uh, Turkey, as Alar also correctly mentioned, very different in, in all that, of course, Israel. But when it comes to Arab countries, it's also a very, very, very complex world uh, of 20-some different countries extending from uh, the... Uh, Atlantic. Yeah, from the Atlantic all the way to... to the Indian. To the Indian Ocean, basically. And um, what I can see, and Amir can actually uh, comment on that, is that countries that are smaller, uh, richer... Uh, economic, in terms of economic resources, oil, gas, you know, banking, insurance, and so on and so forth, uh, they have done well. But that is more, more on the financial and economic side. Politically, as he mentioned, uh, there hasn't been an inch of movement toward liberalization the way we understand it. And not liberal, but in terms of democratization of the institutions, human rights, the right to vote, the right for political parties and for press to be free and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, the, the more or less the northern part of the Arab world, you know, still is grappling with high authoritarian, you know, sort of systems. And, you know, we talk about Assad in Syria, but look at, you know, Egypt, you know, under military, you know, but we don't hear much about it because General Sisi is an ally of United States. You know, he's not in, you know, uh, bad press kind of situation right now. Um, and, of course, when it comes to that, you go all the way to Morocco, uh, where there is a monarchy and it's trying to become at least semi-constitutional, so on and so forth. But they are all grappling with this highly authoritarian political systems and I think the Arab Spring was an attempt uh, to address this, but the attempt, I would say, with maybe exception of Tunisia and North Africa, has not resulted into any major changes. But even in Tunisia, I wouldn't go to say that it actually succeeded. It shook a little bit of the authoritarianism, but it's still there. Now with the you know with Tunis with Tunisia even that's now failed the, the yeah. latest election was yeah, a sham and exactly. you have a, another strong man of authoritarian yeah. power yeah. so yeah. unfortunately we lost Tunis as well yeah exactly all right tell you what we'll do uh, we have folks waiting Dave and Harry we'll go ahead and take our break about a minute early uh, so we can get the questions and the answers together we're going to come right back by the way our phone lines are open we still have several phone lines open for. Professor Al Azam and, of course, uh, Dr. Mir Dadki here in the studio this morning having a great conversation. We will continue right after this. Welcome back to Talk Back. Having a great conversation this morning with Dr. Mir Kia here in the studio along with Professor Amir Al Azam. Folks are waiting on the line. I think we have Dave who's been waiting the longest. Dave, good morning, sir. You're on with our guests. What's your question, please? First of all, I'd like to say I think Israel is making a mistake. And, you know, they need to make friends. And the way they're going about it is not not conducive to f- the future. I mean, killing 40,000 Gazans and, and withholding food from them are not making friends in, in Gaza Strip. And from what I've heard, Hezbollah did not exist prior to Israeli uh, occupation of Lebanon. And uh, if they're going to make friends, they have to rethink their, instead of using a hammer, they need to think rethink about but how to to help people rather than just to make enemies. Dave, Dave, thanks for the call. Gentlemen, your response. Um, I agree with you that the Israelis need to make friends. And this is something that uh, has been debated openly and electorally in Israel for decades where you have at different points in time, such as after the end of the First Intifada in 1990, um, a decision was taken then that we need to also engage with Palestinians. You know, they, they, they dealt with that very, very, you know, shocking moment for them, the, that first intifada, which had started in 1987. It really shook Israeli society to its core. And out of that came the Oslo Peace Accords. Now, they didn't work out quite the way they were supposed to, but Israel has always, you know, kind of oscillated between the need to figure out ways to make peace with the Palestinians make peace with the Arabs, and at the same time, the idea that, no, no, we can keep doing what we're doing, and, uh, you know, we take a few hits here and there, but we can succeed. Ultimately, this is a problem from within Israel that it has to address. And I think 
long term, if they don't address this, if they don't make peace with the Palestinians, remember, um, when you look at the total demographic population of Israel um, between Arabs in the occupied territories and in Israel proper and uh, is Israeli citizens in Israel, it's almost 50-50. It's like 48.5 Arab to 52 or 51.5, um, um, you know, non-Arab Israeli. And when you have that kind of demographic, you can't live in conflict for for for, for uh, in, at infinitum. Okay, let's uh, move on. Get another call. This is Harry. Harry, good morning. You're on with our guests. What's your question, please? Yeah, good morning, gentlemen. First, a comment, then a question. A comment uh, seems like with all all the money and blood spent on fighting ISIS, and yet we're still talking about them. Tells me that the idea of what, destroying Hamas and Hezbollah is pretty much a pipe dream. The best you can do is weaken them, but the the thing will, they'll always be back in the shadows but my question with uh syria as being you know so uh, so much destruction and so much fighting and so, so much division do you see any path or any way that the nation could ever come back together and be a, a nation or you know is there any way you can see that happening that, you are talking yeah. about then. <laughs> yeah, no, that's thanks, a, thanks, Harry. Thanks for the call. That's a great. These are great, two great questions. You uh, again. I'd say you're absolutely right. Um, militarily, you can destroy. Um, well, crush, um, reduce um, military. Uh, you know, forces or, or groups like Hezbollah and Hamas, but you cannot destroy the ideology. The ideology will always kind of stay there and how do you then kind of work on changing that? That's that's another story. But you're quite right. They will be pushed back into the shadows but they will never be completely eliminated because there's an ideological component to it as well. With regards to Syria, <laughs> um, one always you know, one always wants to keep hope alive. One hopes that, you know, Syrians will be able to come together after this conflict is over and figure out ways to talk to each other. The country is very polarized and divided and and and, and, and the, the situation for Syrians inside Syria is, is really, really dire. I'm talking about just everyday normal people that, you know, there's their, their conditions are, are bad. And... And it's all tied to the the wider regional issues as well, and also to whether Assad, the current Assad uh, re- regime, will will make any sort of um, concessions to uh, creating a a, a new uh, Syria that people feel they are able to live in and they are able to sort of uh, work together. Um, I don't know, uh, but I would say. N- not in the, not for the, at least the next ten to fifteen years. And uh, least, you it. know, um, we might want to address also Amr, the fact that since this uh, civil war started, a significant portion of the Syrian population, uh, many of them highly educated, you know, people uh, who could have contributed to the growth and prosperity of their country, uh, they have fled uh, Syria because. And in any situation, when because, there because is, they had the ability to do so, right? yeah, and and because your life is in danger and you're 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 being attacked both by the government and the the ISIS, especially when it became, emerged, but also um, the situation was so dire that so many people chose to even move to Lebanon or Jordan mm-hmm. or go through Turkey and go to Europe, you know. Um, can you speak about that? Uh, yes. Because millions have left Syria, and I don't think the world is much aware of what has really happened. Oh, I, th- to, I think the, I think the world Syria. is. You know, if if you happen to be in one of the countries, I mean, we in the U.S. obviously we don't get a lot of Syrians coming over here because there's a giant ocean that kind of separates us. <laughs> but Europeans, I mean, they felt yeah, they it. Know. They felt it bad. And I remember Ger- the, Germany specifically. Yeah, Germany, right. Italy, France, um, all these countries have. And I remember having an argument with a German uh, member of the of the foreign ministry. Uh, they don't have the title of deputy foreign minister, but the equivalent of. Uh, <laughs> Deputy Foreign Minister, and I, I, I literally got into a, a shouting match with them, and I was saying, don't you understand? There's going to be a humanitarian cat- catastrophe, and people are going to start moving. And when they start moving, they're not going to move to Botswana or Timbuktu or, or, or the South Pole. They're going to come towards you. If you don't stop this war before it kind of really becomes 
catastrophic, you're going to get waves of migration. This was in like February 2012. And sure enough, within a year, it, you know, everything came up. And it's not because I'm a genius or this is rocket science. It's mm. not. It's just very, very obvious. And you have to also just to kind of mark on something um, uh, Merdad was saying. Look, there are different reasons why people move. I mean, people move when they're in immediate physical danger, obviously. That's the, the, the most obvious one. You know, your, your, your air is being bombed, your house has been, you know, sort, of, sort of your bullets are flying around you, so you get up and you run. But then there are other reasons why a lot of people move. And these are when, even after the fighting stops, I mean, the fighting has stopped. There isn't a lot of fighting happening right now in Syria. But the economic situation, the ability for people to provide for their families and for themselves have become so dire and so bad. And not least because of the sanctions that are on the country. And I'm not suggesting that we should remove the sanctions. That's another whole Mm. story in itself. Um, But because of those sanctions, because of the isolation of the regime and the unwillingness of the regime to budge on that, the conditions inside Syria today are so bad for everyday lives, the, the, you know, the lives of everyday people, that people are also moving. So the, the, the reason why people are moving now is not the same as why people moved in 2013. How many people uh, would you say have left? Oh, I would say in excess of six to eight million. I'd say about... Six to eight million. Yes. I'd uh, say you have about... So almost half, half of the population. Yes, about, about, about a third of the population. Yeah. It, yeah. We'd say almost half... The, about half the population has been both internally and externally displaced. Oh, my God. And about a th- maybe a quarter to a third externally. We're going to take a one-minute timeout. Skip is waiting very patiently to visit with you gentlemen. So, wow, this is... Uh, I, I hope everybody's taking notes. There won't be a <laughs> test, but uh, I'm hoping you're taking notes because this is fascinating and we are learning from folks who have been there. So we're going to come right back after this one-minute timeout. John test. We are back. This is Talk Back, and we're entering our final segment uh, with our guests, uh, Dr. Mirdad Kia, Professor Amir Al-Azam, and Skip has been waiting through the break. Skip, good morning. Thank you for holding, sir. What's your question? Good morning, Peter, and thank you. And and it's uh, always wonderful to hear Dr. Kia, and thank you for coming on and helping us learn more about this, Dr. Hassam. I hope I have it right, sir. Uh, and. And Dr. Key, uh, you, you know, I think that this, this treasure state, that you are certainly one of our treasures, and I'll always appreciate your, your lectures. And and uh, so I'll ask you, because two different people called me when I, or, or I, I called one, they called me about who's on today, and I told them it was you about these subjects, and they said, uh, and this was the question they, they both asked, would you please tie anything that's happening now to, to biblical uh, teaching, if there is if there is any tie, or is it too nebulous at this point? Is there any way, any general statement you can make about the timeline of everything that's happening, or 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 what direction we're going? Uh, this, we're in incredible times in my lifetime, and and it's like uh, we we better be we better be praying that something nice happens. Uh, so that uh, we can enjoy this wonderful world in peace. And if you can give us any idea about right. how this ties to the body, we'd sure like to know. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the call, Skip. So, uh, yeah, gentlemen, go ahead. Um, tied to biblical teaching. I don't know. I don't know if this is going to be exactly what your um, friends had in mind, but um, it was something that um, kind of struck me as rather ironic uh, when I was thinking about it. Um, the Lebanese um, basically have been saved, or are being uh, have been saved in a way um, twice by the Israelis. The first time when uh, in 1982 they went in and essentially took out the PLO um, and forced Yasser Arafat to leave um, Beirut. Um, f- uh, you know, uh, which he went into exile into Tunis after that, and so the and and in that they, they that cleared the the domination of um, the PLO over Lebanese politics and the Lebanese um, sort of landscape, and now this is the second time um, that the Israelis have intervened and in destroying Hezbollah, they have yet again given the Lebanese another second chance. <laughs> to essentially uh, <coughs> clean up the mess and, and get rid of Iranian hegemony and Iranian sort of uh, 
control these are of things, that country. Th these are things that they obviously couldn't have done themselves. Well, they could have done, but they didn't mm. do it for, okay. for whatever reason. They didn't do it. Okay. But in the end, it took an Israeli you know, invasion in both cases with, with I should say, catastrophic um, results for the... For the people that are being, you know, hit in the villages and in the towns and in the cities and 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 so on and so forth. So I'm not saying these were nice things, but the, these are the outcomes. So um, I don't know if there's anything biblical in that, other than the fact that uh, the Israelis are are saving the Lebanese from themselves, and that's the second time. It's like real estate location, <laughs> location, location. Um, uh, you know. And now they're going to go after, I think, the uh, the further Iranian yeah. um, uh, pipeline of, of arms into the region. And, and ultimately, they may even go after the Iranians themselves and save now the other Arab yeah. um, states in the Gulf and elsewhere from Iranian hegemony, ultimately. So there's there's something ironic about... The, the 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 people of Israel, the yeah. Hebrews, yeah. <laughs> saving the, the the Arabs from you know, the, from mean, the when wicked the, uh, yeah, version. Yeah. <laughs> the shifting sands of the Middle East. You know that um, one time we were trying to find a catchy uh, title for a course, and it's said shifting sands of the Middle East. You know, here is um, as. Uh, uh, you all know, you know, I... We, we, have I about, we have about three and a half minutes, yeah. so go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, I was in Iran uh, before the revolution, and who is the closest ally of uh, the Shah? You know, one of them was, of course, uh, President Sadat of Egypt, yeah. but the other one was Israel. Uh, a lot of Israelis in Iran, you know, at all levels, from agriculture to security to military training and so on and so forth. And uh, we always were told that... Uh, uh, the Hebrews, the Jewish people, were allies of Iran from the ancient times when Cyrus, uh, the founder of the Persian Empire, liberated Babylon and freed the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, uh, which had been destroyed by the Babylonians, speaking yes. of the Bible. And that's why Cyrus uh, is the only Persian mentioned in the Old Testament as the anointed one, the... God's shepherd and so on and so forth. Um, so you live with that sort of um, religion, a bit of mythology, but a real bit of politics, in fact, that this alliance goes back to ancient times. But look where now Israel and Iran stand. All that alliance is gone. And, uh, and yet, I have to tell you, there is still reverberations. Uh, the son of the former Shah, uh, Reza Pahlavi, uh, was in Israel before October 7th last year and received a, you know, red carpet reception from President of Israel, from Prime Minister Netanyahu and a whole bunch of other Israeli officials to the chagrin of the regime in Tehran. So these things are constantly shifting back and forth. In 82, I remember when Israel went into Lebanon. Amr, I know you are the expert in this, but... Uh, the Shia in southern Lebanon cheered the Israelis yes, did. Uh, coming in uh, because the Israelis were viewed as the liberators from whom? From the PLO and Arafat, of yes. course, who was in Beirut and he was trapped in Beirut. Um, uh, but then what happened? The Israelis stayed and, of course, it brought the wrath of the Shia against them. So you have to constantly watch this region shifting uh, in terms of its alliances. Would you mind in the last minute here uh, sharing specifically why uh, why Professor El-Azam is, is here in Missoula? Yeah. So he's helping us, of course, uh, evaluate our center here at the university. Um, but we thought that um, um, since he's here and he is so, so knowledgeable and so well informed, but also he is such an such a brilliant an analyst of the uh, situation in the region that we take our, our this opportunity and uh, later today he will meet uh, with some of our students and attend classes and uh, and so we really appreciate his presence here and 
we we feel very privileged for him to be with us. I say thank you to both of you. Thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for having me on. Sure, thank you Always for sharing your expertise and and uh, we uh, taking all these questions. We appreciate it. Always okay, a pleasure. Mr. Nick, as we look forward, what's coming up on tomorrow's fabulous program, sir? Uh, from eight to eight thirty, we'll have Governor Gianforte on the phone, and then from eight thirty to nine, we'll do a little open phones. And then the last hour, we'll have Attorney General Austin Knutson from 9 to 10 taking your calls. All right. There you go. Lots to look forward to. A big political day tomorrow uh, for Wednesday. And uh, on behalf of our guests, thank you all for calling. Have a great day, everybody.